Kia ora tātou, aloha mai kākou, <coughs> excuse me, ko māgi māka taku ingoa, ko nāti kahununu, nāti awa, nai tahu, nā iwi, uh, no Aotearoa au, uh, <coughs> hia pulapeka, uh, vau, uh, mā ke, ke kula nui, uh, uh, o Hawaii mā mā noa. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to extend my apology, uh, my partner's apology, Dr. Leona Wong, um, he was unable to be here today, he's teaching. Um, Leona is actually a graduate from the linguistics department, but he is noted for having written the first uh, dissertation, doctoral dissertation in the Hawaiian language. Okay. So I'd like to begin my introduction of uh, Dr. Titaka Keegan by reading you a story that I wrote. My grandfather, Aritaku Marker, was raised in a small rural community in, of Aotearoa, New Zealand. <clears throat> his first language was Māori and he spoke only a little English. When his son and my father, Inia Whangatawa Marka, was born, Aritaku was well in his 50s. Every day, my father would read the English newspaper to Aritaku, and they would discuss the day's events in English. This was Aritaku's way of learning the language of his son. When I asked my father if Aritaku taught him Māori, he paused for some time, and then he replied wistfully, no. <coughs> Aritaku was a prolific writer in the, in the Māori language. He had a command of many genres. Whakapapa, maps, legal papers, committee reports, waiata, poetry and stories. It is interesting that one of his waiata chastises Māori for turning their backs on Māori ways, especially caring for the land, and embracing Pākehā ways of desiring too much money and drinking too much alcohol. The last two lines of Aritaku's waiata predict the fate of Māori to be left on the side of the road with nothing. There is irony in Aritaku's prophetic writing. Although his children's legacy included our ancestral lands, it did not include our ancestral language and the knowledge contained therein. For many reasons, Aritaku, a caring and loving father, felt that his children would fare better in their lives if they embraced the language and culture of the Pākehā. When Aritaku's youngest children were of school age, he moved his family from the country to the city. This was well over 30 years after he wrote his cautionary waiata. I believe that in the time that passed between the writing of his waiata and moving his family to the city, Aritaku was forced to realise that the English language had become pervasive, especially in the domain of public education. Schooling for democracy through paideia had become Aritaku's reality and it was in this English-only context that he made the choice to do what he thought was best for his children, prioritise the English language and all its trappings. When I look at Aritaku's beautiful command of the Māori language, I can only wonder at the devastation he might have felt in making this decision. Or perhaps like other Māori elders of the time, he felt the decision had already been made for him. He saw the writing on the wall and none of it was Māori. This leg the legacy of Aritaku's children became the legacy of his grandchildren. This tragic loss, coupled with a public education system that had as its goal, primary goal, the assimilation of Māori into the broader culture of the New Zealand democratic state, ensured that within the span of two generations in my family, much of the knowledge <clears throat> of a thousand years could be accessed only with difficulty and always through the hazy lens of colonisation. This is the historical context in which Dr Keegan's work sits. When Dr Holton asked me to introduce Dr Keegan, I immediately took to my email and sent off inquiries to three of my closest friends in Aotearoa, Professors Linda Smith, Leone Pihama and Huya Yonke. What should I say about him and his work, I asked. The responses came in unison. Uh, just tell everybody he's awesome. But I thought I'd better dig deeper into this awesomeness for you. <laughs> Through my research, I have found that Dr. Keegan has received an Excellence in Research Award from the University of Waikato for his work that launches the Māori language and its learners into the technological, te technological world of the 21st century. While many who work in the field of Indigenous language revitalisation or normalisation tend to look back to the past, Dr. Keegan has his eyes set firmly on the future. Māori Twitter, Māori blogs, Māori Facebook, Māori Snapchat, who'd have thought? He has taken the lead 
role in developing Microsoft translation for Te Reo Māori, for digitising Māori and Hawaiian newspapers, and for researching the usability of the smartphone with the Māori language interface. His many publications and presentations herald this groundbreaking research. I also learned that Dr Keegan holds multiple awards for teaching excellence at both the university and the national level. I watched a video of him where he talks with great enthusiasm about uplifting the spirits of his students. It is very clear that the passion he has for technology and te reo Māori is transferred to his students through his teaching. After all, he sees them as the carriers of the language into the future. This is just a very brief sketch of the mana of this morning's keynote speaker. At this point, I think it is time for me to step aside and welcome him. And so it is with great pleasure that I ask you to join me in welcoming the awesome Dr. Titaka Keegan. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Aloha koukou. <clears throat> uh, uh, e honori he gloria ki runga, he maunga rongo ki te matua te whenua, he whakaaro pai titi ki titi i pai mariri. Uh, Tuatahi tukana kia mihi atu ki te tangata whenua, <clears throat> ngā kanaka Māori, uh, tērā i whakawaiti te hui i te rā nei, uh, koutou katoa, uh, mihi ki ngā maunga, uh, te whenua nei, te ru, o mānoa, te moana rongonui, te moana nui a kiwa, mo te rā tēnā koutou. <coughs> um, I'm not sure if I really want to talk too much because of some of that awesomeness might not <laughs> be shown so much. Uh, uh, so, tua tei kei te mea tu kia koe mākua, te tuku mai i rā kororo, uh, i rā rūkahu mōku, uh, tēnā koe. Um, there's a couple of people that I really need to thank. Um, uh, I, I certainly want to thank Gary Holton and Brad McDonald uh, for organising all of this work, um, for selecting me to speak. I'm not sure if you're going to think that's a good idea after the next half hour or so, but I uh, just want to thank you guys for all the work that you've done. Um, a special thanks also to um, Jim. Uh, it seems to me that Jim is the glue that's holding all of this committee together and has been working through all of the ICD, IC, LDC committees, nor data, uh, Jim. Um, and also thanks to Andrea for all the work that you've done for endangered, endangered languages through this, this conference and all the other work to do, nor data, Tenakwe. Um, <clears throat> also want to thank all the sponsors of the conference. Um, I'd, I'd say your names, but I can't because there's too many of you and I don't know the names. <laughs> um, but thank you all the sponsors anyway that allows this conference to happen, that allows all of us people to be here. Um, I want to mihi atu ki te, me ki te wairua o te conference, the, the spirit of the conference, and that we're here to help uh, endangered languages. Uh, and then I also want to Mihi to everybody that's here um, because of the reasons that you're here. Uh, and then finally, um, it seems like we have 125 languages represented at this conference. Uh, okay. Um, I want to start by having a look at what I think we're here about. Um, so this is the International Conference for Language, for language Documentation and uh, Conservation. So I just kind of want to, from my perspective, what do those words mean to me? Um, so I want to look at it from three perspectives. So who are we? 
Um, and this is kind of my perspective of who, who we are. Uh, what are we doing and why are we doing it? Uh, so who are we? So if you, lead, if you read the introduction to the conference, it seems to me that we're two groups of people. Um, we're language documentators, language documenters, um, and those striving to retain and maintain our language. So kind of, we've got kind of two sets of people here at this conference. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, well, if we're language documenters, then we're documenting language. And if we're striving to maintain our language, then we're, we are looking at preservation, conservation, revitalization, and normalization. And I heard another word this morning, maintenance as well. Um, through the work that I've done, it seems like we've been using these words um, at different aspects of the work of the research. Um, so perhaps in the beginning, we were looking at preserving our language, uh, and then we decided that preservation wasn't enough and we needed to conserve our language. So then the language is starting to be used a bit more. And then we've moved from conserving our language to revitalizing our language, um, putting some spark back into it. Um, and now currently thinking, uh, mostly in Aotearoa, not all the time in Aotearoa, but mostly in Aotearoa is we want to normalise the language. Uh, we want to make the language so that it's spoken normally, because then we'll know it's healthy and living. Uh, so it seems to me we have people at this conference that are working with preservation, working with conservation, uh, working with revitalisation, um, and us from Aotearoa, perhaps, are mostly working with normalisation. And through all of those steps, we're doing documentation. Uh, why do we do this? Um, I, I don't really think that's a question that we really, that I really need to discuss too much, because um, I think it's kind of like almost preaching to the preached. Um, for me, we were doing it for, for two reasons. Um, because when a language is lost, there is so much knowledge that is lost. And because when a language is lost, there is an identity that's lost. <clears throat> so here's two quotes that kind of sum it up a little bit for me. Um, so what do we lose when we lose a language? Uh, essentially, an enormous amount of culti uh, cultural heritage cultural viewpoints, cultural perspective, cultural knowledge. And with the destruction of a language, we have a destruction of a rooted identity. Uh, so that's one perspective. And then as a perspective from uh, the indigenous language themselves, so there's four quotes here, and I won't try to read the first two because I do not want to embarrass myself or those languages. Uh, so the first quote is a, a Welsh quote, um, land without language is land without heart. The second quote is an Irish quote, uh, a country without its soul, or a country without its language is a country without its soul. Uh, we have a quote from here, uh, e ola, ka olelo Hawaii, um, and then a quote from uh, our language, ko te reo Māori, ko te mano Māori. So those are the reasons I believe we are doing uh, the work that we're doing and I don't need to discuss that because I think everybody's on board. Uh, also I'd like to acknowledge as well that the United Nations have stated that 2019 is the year of the indigenous language. Uh, so I think that's great for us because there's got to be opportunities in there for us. Opportunities to support our language, to fund our language. Um, so. I'd like to encourage everybody to try and make the most of that opportunity because next year will be the year of something else. <laughs> so let's jump on board and run with this while we have it. Uh, okay, who we are. So this is kind of my take of who we are, what we're doing. Uh, so who we are, yeah, what we're doing and why we're doing this. Um, that in mind, and, and um, I hope Gary and Brad aren't going to be mad. I kind of changed my topic. 
So, so this was a topic I said I was going to talk about when they asked me to come and talk. Uh, language normalization through technology, the Te Reo Māori example. Uh, but when I actually had a look at um, the conference and what I was doing and I thought about those previous two slides um, and I actually looked at the attendees, it seems to me that there's only two groups here um, for Te Reo Māori and I'm one of them. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense to me to talk too much about Te Reo Māori. Um, I said I'll talk about it because that's what I know about. Um, but I want to kind of change my talk. So, sorry guys. And I, I just want to talk about language normalisation through technology. Um, but I don't want to specifically talk about Te Reo Māori. I don't want to talk about all the different things that Te Reo Māori has gone through over the years. Um, all the technology initiatives we've tried and failed, uh, what we're currently doing at the moment and what we're going to do in the future. I don't want to specifically talk about that uh, because I think the audience that should hear all of that kind of talk um, is perhaps a more real Māori audience or audience in Aotearoa. So what I thought I would do was I'd just talk about language normalisation through technology and some of my experiences. Um, some of the ways that I was put into positions to do things. Um, and hopefully uh, some of you people can see some opportunities or, or avenues where you can be in the same position. So, okay, um, I want to start with a little bit of background about myself and I'm going to do this really quickly because I don't really like to talk about myself. Um, I grew up on this mountain, my father, we had a farm, my parents had a farm like right at the edge of this mountain, this is Maunga Taranaki and Taranaki, uh, I was born not far from here, I grew up there, but I'm not from there, I'm from this mountain, um, and to me that's actually a much bigger, taller, larger mountain, uh, so this is um, Mount Porongia, this is in the Waikato, uh, this is where my tribe is from, Waikato Maniopoto, uh, this is one of my marae, uh, Pūrikiriki marae, uh, those are all my aunties and uncles, like direct first aunties and uncles, because in Māori we have lots and lots of aunties and uncles, but those ones are all my real ones. Well, they're all real. They're <laughs> <laughs> those are the closest ones. Um, and if any of them were here, they would be growling me right now. Uh, I left high school and I went to this place, which no longer exists, um, and did a diploma in computer engineering. I spent two years in Hamilton fixing computers, two years in Australia fixing computers, another two years in Auckland, so six years as a computer hardware engineer. Um, and then I took a break from computer engineering and I went to Waikato University. Uh, I did a total immersion Māori degree called Te Tohu Paite. Uh, I did that for two years and then I taught with the Māori language department, taught Te Reo Māori for two years. Uh, and then I jumped across to the computer science department and I've been in the computer science department for 20 odd years mixing computer science and Māori language. Let's quickly get off that picture because that's an ugly smile. Um, a quick background about Te Reo Māori so you can know where we're coming from. Um, New Zealand is the top of the world right here. Uh, we're part of the Polynesian Triangle, so even though we're flying a long way to be here, we're still all part of the Polynesian Triangle. Um, the area that I'm from, so this is the North Island of New Zealand, is around this area, Waikato Manioputo. There's another side that's from over here, uh, and then another side that's from in there. Um, Māori language is an Eastern Polynesian language. Um, maybe one in five of Māori people can speak Māori language. We've got about four and a half million people in New Zealand. It's not all that many really. Um, <clears throat> and despite, uh, despite what other languages may think, uh, we consider our language, well our language is officially classified as between definitely endangered and severely endangered. <laughs> Um, this is a graph of how we've been faring over the last, so 1996, 2001, 2006, 
Um, it's a percentage of people who are able to speak Māori. And the graph is going down. <clears throat> so we're in an environment, despite what other languages might think, uh, we're in an environment where we feel, we, we know our language is threatened, and if we don't do something about it, our language will be lost. And for the reasons we've stated earlier, that will be said. Uh, okay. When I go around, I like to tell people I'm a language activist. Um, this is a scary thing for some people because they think as an activist, you're going to like burn down the building and <laughs> do some really horrible things. Um, I don't think you have to do that to be a language activist. Though I do have some Welsh friends who I know are language activists and they swear it wasn't them but there was a group of Welsh activists that went around super gluing um, bank tellers because they weren't, um, well, they weren't speaking in the Welsh language so I don't know if that's a good idea to get your point across but I know most of the banks in Wales now support the Welsh language so <laughs> maybe super glue is a good idea um, but that's kind of not kind of the activism that I'm talking about. <clears throat> okay, so I consider a language activist as someone who actively tries to promote their language. Okay, quite simply, someone who actively tries to promote their language. Um, so from that perspective, I like to think that everybody at this conference was a language activist. Um, oh, geez, what's it doing there in Maori? Uh, so, ahokoe iti hiponamu. So, apologies, that was supposed to be in English. Even though your work is small, it's still precious. Okay, so even though you have, you're doing a small work, it's still precious. Um, language activists do things for the right reasons. So we do this work for our language, not because we, we want to be famous or, or we want to earn lots of money. We're doing it because we know languages are important. Uh, language activists are a group of people who like to help others. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of that at this conference. Um, language activists grow relationships with sister, sister languages because when they do that, unexpected benefits can happen for their language. And there's, I have lots of examples where that's happened. <coughs> language activists get ideas, enthusiasm, encouragement from others, uh, but ultimately, but at the end of the day, they have to do it themselves. If you really want to work to promote your language, you can't leave it up to other people, you have to go and do it. So, uh, that's, I kind of class myself as a language activist, and that's kind of what I think I'm doing, what I think I do, and that's what I hope what everybody here does. Um, there can be um, different extremes of language activists. Uh, so that's just like a normal language activist. We've got this other guy who I call the hardcore language activist. Okay, so the hardcore language activist, and if you're not one of these, you'll know somebody who is. Um, hardcore language activists are selfish but generous. Okay, selfish but generous. It kind of seems an irony, but um, I was given a talk at this conference in 2011 and uh, me and one of my students were talking about how some of the things we created for Māori language weren't being used. And we started the talk, and we are talking for like three or four minutes, and this guy got up in the middle of our talk, and he says, is this what you're gonna be talking about in this talk? And I, I said, yeah, that's, you know, we had it in the program, that's what we're talking about. And he said to me, this isn't gonna help me, and he got up and he walked out. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, well, that's a little bit rude. <laughs> But then I thought, because if I looked at him, he was here, he was here at this conference, his sole purpose was to find opportunities that could help his language. Okay, he was very selfish in that, in that aspect, very narrow vision, very focused. <clears throat> and as he walked out the door, I thought of this and I thought, that guy's going to achieve a lot for his language. Okay, we've got to acknowledge that guy, he's going to do lots for his language. So. You've got to be selfish, um, but be generous. But the generosity I'm talking about is within your own language. Give your time, give your heart, give your money uh, to people, to opportunities with your own language. That's a hardcore language activist. <clears throat> uh, language activists are poor, as in financially poor. 
because you do not have time to go and do stuff that makes you rich, what you're doing is you're doing work to support your language. Okay, so you're poor, but you're rich, just not rich financially. You're rich with the knowledge of your language, you're rich in the thought that you are doing something that can help your language. Uh, <clears throat> Margie mentioned earlier about the doom and gloom that we see for our languages. Okay, uh, endangered languages constantly have doom and gloom surrounding us. It's a part of the profile. Uh, but within that doom and gloom, we have hope. We think we can do better. You know, there's opportunities here. We can do something. Okay, so there's doom and gloom, but there's also hope. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. I mean, we'd be out making some money now. Um, uh, <coughs> I run, it's not really ironically, but one of the characteristics I've noticed about hardcore language activists is they're really supportive of children. Uh, children are important. Uh, children are important, grandchildren are important, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, and of course, the work you're doing for a language, it's for the children, really. It's not really for us, it's for the other generations that come. Uh, there was a great song, it was originally sung by George Benson, uh, if I had half a singing voice, I'd sing it. Uh, Whitney Houston released a version, and it says, I believe the children are our future. Uh, teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. That's what the work we are doing is doing. Okay? It is giving our children a sense of pride to make it easier for them. Uh, okay. Uh, selfish but rich, or selfish but generous, poor but rich, doom and gloom but hope, devoted to children, fiercely passionate about language. You will see this in any hardcore language activist. Um, and behind, I think, behind any successful project, language initi uh, initiative, uh, technology that's working for a language, you will see one of these guys, a hardcore language activist. Um, so my hope is that you be that guy. Uh, how are we going for time? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so an explanation about a language activist. I want to talk about three things, and I'm going to have to talk quickly because there are lots of things I could talk about. I'm going to talk about three things that happens when you get involved with language work. And one of them is serendipity. <clears throat> so ser serendipity is the Pākehā word. It's more like things are meant to happen, I guess. Um, I want to talk about it on one particular collection that I've worked on, so the newspaper collection. So what happened was um, there was a person who worked at the library at our university, at Waikato University, her name was Ani Pohudu, and she came to me one day and said, we've just got this collection of newspaper. They've gone around the country, one of the, the larger libraries in New Zealand, the Alexander Temple Library, went around the, the country, collected all of these newspaper, photographed them all, and put them all on microfiche. So we've got this new microfiche collection. It's a really a great collection. You should come and have a look at it sometime. Uh, there's a lot, a, a lot of treasures inside these old newspapers. And so that's how we would look at it. We'd stick a sheet in one of these microfiche readers, and then you'd search through it start to finish trying to find things that you were looking for. So that, that like happened on a Tuesday, and that was about the time when I was thinking about leaving the Māori department and going over to the computer science department, primarily to try and teach one of their papers in Te Reo Māori. And I had a guy from the computer science department, one of the professors, famous guy called Ian Witten, come to my office. He heard he was coming over, and he came to my office and he says, we've just built this brand new software. So this was the day after I'd met with Ani. Ian came over and said, we've just built this brand new software. It's the New Zealand Digital Library software. It's a really great software for collections. And he said, it would be really good if there was a collection of Māori language material that we could put on there. Do you have any of that? And I said, no, nah, we don't have any of that. You're <laughs> dreaming. I don't know what you're thinking about. We don't have some. It would be great if we did. And then as I was walking out the door, I looked on my office and there was that pamphlet that Ani had dropped by about the Māori newspaper collection. So it was just a matter of like 24 hours. I had this collection, I had this opportunity to put it in this environment. So I went to see the department. 
of computer scientists, Department of Computer Science Tier, a guy called Mike Eppley, and says, I've got this idea, I think we should put this collection um, in a digital library. And he said, what collection is it? And, and um, I explained to him, and he said, hang on, I think one of my grandfathers was one of the editors to, that, um, to one of those newspapers. And then we had a quick look and he says, yes, my grandfather was one of the editors to one of, the, one of those newspapers. And then his next question to me was, what do you want to do? And it was really a great question because normally the question is, how much will it cost? <laughs> right? He didn't say how much will it cost, he says, what do you want to do? He says, okay, well, we want to digitize this collection, put it into a digital environment and then make it available as a, you know, a, New, Zealand, a New Zealand digital library collection. So he agreed, cut a long story short, three years later, <clears throat> We have this collection, so this is the Māori New Paper Collection, 17,000 pages, 34 separate articles, written between 18, uh, 1842 and 1933. Uh, a treasure chose a beautiful Māori language text that's freely available on the internet for text search. Okay, so it's a, it's a beautiful thing that happened because Ani come and see me on a Tuesday and Ian came and see me on a Wednesday. And Mark happened to be the chairperson of the computer science department. And uh, once we had this up and running, the, some people in Hawaii here realized they have a, a collection as well. And so we were able to help them do a similar thing with the Hawaiian newspapers. Um, I'm not saying the Hawaiian newspapers were created because of my meeting with Ani and Ian, uh, but you know maybe they would have got there anyway. But because of the serendipity happening, um, some larger things can happen. So, uh, serendipity is, is I think uh, something that occurs a lot in the work that we do, um, and it's something we should run with. Okay, so that was the first thing, serendipity. The second thing that we have to be aware of is to seize opportunities. Um, so, this man here, Craig Neville Manning, gave me a call in like around 2003, and he says, we've got this uh, software that we're working on. It would be really cool if we had a Māori language interface to it. And I was like, Ian, um, I was like, Craig, I'm kind of working on my PhD. I haven't got time. I'll ask some people. We'll start the ball rolling. Uh, like five years later, as the PhD was finished, he brings me back up again. How are we getting on with that translation? <clears throat> and I said to him, well, actually, let's have a look at it. So I talked to some people. We knocked over the translation. And the interface, of course, was this interface here. So, 2008, we did this translation, uh, Māori language translation of the Google web search interface, GWIS, they call it. <clears throat> uh, because of that translation, uh, I decided to apply to go and spend some time at Google. Um, I eventually got there. It was, it's kind of difficult to get into Google. I eventually got there. Spent six months here uh, with my wife and family, took everybody over there, and we were working on this thing here. This is called the Google Translator Toolkit. So this is a device that assists translators by supplying um, terms that have previously been translated. So a really handy tool. Uh, we spent six months. We got it working for, for Real Māori, which is kind of difficult given how much language resources we had. Uh, came back to New Zealand. Um, <clears throat> I think that was 2009, and then a few years later, uh, because of that work, Google was able to enable Māori language onto Google Translate. Um, and at the time, it worked really well, uh, but then what happened over the years, I think they were getting, they were trawling their data from the web, and the, the Translate version of Google started working really poorly. And so when any, anybody asked me, was that you that did Google Translate, I'd always say no. <laughs> Uh, they did it themselves, uh, but I had, actually had a look yesterday uh, and I checked it out and uh, it seems like they've fixed it a little bit. So um, this is a translation here and apart from the first word, it's, it's kind of correct. So I don't, maybe, maybe they've had a look at things. Um, <clears throat> so all of the work that happened through this project happened because there was an opportunity to translate an interface and then all of these other things led on from it. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to do stuff, but you just got to do it. 
Um, this is this is a keyboard that I worked with Microsoft in the late 90s. They released it in 2003 that allows us to type the Macron character. Um, <clears throat> a couple of years after that, they approached me and they said, we want to translate Microsoft Windows and Microsoft Office into Te Reo Māori. And I was like, OK, how, how big is that? And I was like, 900,000 words in 180 separate strings. Can you do it? And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was like, um, I didn't think we could do it, but I thought, wouldn't it be a cool thing if we could? Because all of our children are using, at schools, are using Microsoft Office. And wouldn't it be really cool if we could get that happening for Te Reo Māori? Uh, so they, Microsoft paid us to translate it. Uh, they paid us hundreds and thousands of dollars but we got a, we got a team together, we got like about eight translators. Uh, we worked together. The amount of time they gave us to do it, by the time it finished, we were only like three quarters done and we ran out of money. So they gave us a little bit more money and we ran out of that money. So we asked the Māori Language Commission and then they gave us some money and they were really angry with us. Uh, but we got it done. Ultimately, we got it done. So here is, so on the left, this is Microsoft Word in Te Reo Māori, and this is PowerPoint happening in Te Reo Māori. So we, we did that, and it was released, um, I think, 2008, and then later versions of Office and Māori have been translated, but not by us. Uh, I've actually got a video of um, some school children who are using it, so I just wanted to play it. If I can get this technology to work. So if I go into here and then I jump over to here, ignore that guy. Culture. And Kunga Hura Pakiha, Kahuati Rato Yetahi Mahiakwe, and a Hipakiha Te Koriro, and a He Uwa. So it's the translation isn't that good. What she's saying, it's hard to do work in English. Um, it's easier to do it all in Māori. The work that you're doing, because they're in Māori medium schools, it's everything, it's easier if everything stays in Te Reo Māori. When we first looked at the project, uh, translating Microsoft products into our language so that, so that these products could be used in our language, when we first looked at it and the enormity of it, our first thought was, it's too big, it's too large, we can't do it. Our second thought was, we have to do it. It's too important. And no matter how hard it is and what we've got to do, we just have to do it. Tino no inat me he Māori ahu. Kia marama, ngā Māori mena, kare he tino kaha so rato, pānu i te reo pākea. Ka haere au ki runga i te Microsoft Word me te PowerPoint. Ana ka mahi i etahi rangahau pāna ki te kingitanga me te awa waikato me te iwi Māori. So I just want to um, stop it there because... Um, and I want to show a picture of this little girl here. So um, it worked. We put it in some schools, we got the children, we got the teachers on board, um, and it worked. Children were coming into school, Māori medium school, using the computer in Māori, Microsoft Office in Māori, you know, logging off in Māori, going around, playing around. So it worked, it was great. Um, but what happened was it didn't work in all of the schools. Um, and I was talking to this girl a couple of days ago before I came over, and I said to her, when you use your computer now, do you use it in Māori or English? And she said she uses it in English. And I said, why is that? When did you start using it in English? And she said, when she left this school, so this is primary school, she went to a secondary school, Māori medium secondary school, all of their computers were using English. Even though the software is available in Māori, all of the computers is using it in English, so she had to use it, learn to use it in English, and now she's at university, um, the software she's using there, they're using it all in English, so she's pretty much switched to using it in English. And I kind of thought that was happening. It's, for me, it's kind of sad. I kind of thought that was happening. Um, but we did a survey a few years back. Thank you, Ngā Pera. We did a survey a few years back, and we went around and asked some schools. Um, we asked some schools how many of them we're using it and I actually think so 25% so these are Māori medium schools 
schools are teaching their children in Māori who are speaking Māori the whole time, and 24% said they were using Office, and 21% said they were using Windows. I actually think they lied. I think it's actually quite a lot less. Um, but that was kind of quite disappointing. All of the work and effort that had gone into it um, wasn't really being used. Um, and then this, this report was released last year and it looks at Māori medium schools and what software they're using. And if you see there's like less than 10% um, are using Windows and Office in the Māori language. So the software is available, but it's not really being used by the people it was built for. And there's some good reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is the teachers don't understand the new words and it's the teachers that have to teach the children. So I think we could have done things better. Um, but we completed it and it's there and it's available. Um, my computer's using it. I don't really want to show that. Um, okay, so sometimes it's hard but you just got to do things. Uh, here's an example number two. And I'll just quickly give this example. So there was this book I read, um, it's called The Voice in the Machine by Roberto Priscelli. Um, and it, he's, this guy's been like 30 years working in the industry, how to do, how to get the machine to speak. And um, if you read this book, it pretty much says it's impossible. Well, it's certainly impossible for smaller languages. So I remember reading this book and thinking, oh Jesus, that's a bit of a hard task. And then I had a couple of crazy guys come and see me one day these two guys here come and see me one day and says we want to we're from a radio station up north we've got lots of material spoken and we want to turn it into text you know how can we get you know our machine to read text and I says well you know that's kind of difficult uh, but good luck <laughs> and so they went away and then they came back a year later and they've done it these guys have done it um, I don't really want to talk too much about what they've done and how they've done it. Some really cool tricks. Um, but these guys done it. These guys are actually talking. They're talking on Sunday. Uh, they're in the Asia room. Um, and it's amazing the things that they've kind of done. If I had time, I'd show some videos of them, but I don't have time. But thanks anyway, guys, for the video. Um, <clears throat> this is a really difficult problem to do. These guys have done it. Awesome work. Okay, so it's hard, but just do it. So I've learned a bunch of lessons um, with, all the, with all the jobs I've been involved with. Lesson number one, you need to get kaumatua support. Kaumatua is like elders, elder support. Um, language com community support is essential for any projects you want to do with the language, I believe. Um, often this can include spiritual support. It should include spiritual support, uh, karakia, prayers, help things move along. Uh, if you're doing anything with technology, if you don't get language support to do it, then you're doomed to fail, I believe. Uh, sometimes this can hurt. Um, it can hurt because if you're seeking support from your family, kind of like your family are the best ones to stab you in the back. Uh, it's kind of sad, and I've thought about why are they so quick to do this, but I think as whatever projects you do, there's always going to be the doubters. Um, but when your doubters are your own people, you kind of feel it a little bit more. Um, so you've got to rise above that, okay? Otherwise, you'll never get nothing done. And just on that fact, so we had a meeting earlier in the week, some really legendary people coming to talk about um, how technology is moving into our language. And this was one of the comments. We have to be true to our tūpuna, to our ancestors, uh, but we don't have to be slaves to them. You know, we shouldn't be so scared that we end up doing nothing. So, lesson number one is get kaumātua support, get uh, language, community language support, um, and use that as best as you can. Lesson number two, strive for the stars. Uh, we have a Māori saying, uh, ko te taupa ki hai puwai i aku moe moe. The only thing preventing me from achieving what I want to achieve is myself. So don't prevent yourself from achieving. Go out and do those amazing things. Uh, and then we need to act smart. So we need to question why are we incorporating technology? What is the real reason for this? Uh, who has or cedes rights to what we're creating? What is the long-term sustainability? Uh, because if you build it, they don't always come. 
okay? And lots of examples we've seen, we've built some great stuff and people haven't always come. Uh, so three lessons, one more lesson, you must be good at promoting your language. And then this is where I'll give it to the boys from Tehiku, they're from a radio station, they know how to promote stuff, they're awesome. Um, it's difficult for Māori to promote the work that we do, or Indigenous people to promote the work that we do, because of the saying, e kore te kumara, e kore rō mo tōna reka. Uh, the, the sweet potato does not show or indicate or go on about how sweet it really tastes. Um, so that's kind of a saying we have because um, we'd rather do the work than stand up on the stage and talk about it and have people say like awesome things or whatever. It's better if we just go and do the work. Um, so it's difficult for us to promote our own work, but we've got to do it. <clears throat> Here's an example. Um, I had some guys contact me from this group called SwiftKey, and they says, uh, we can put Māori language into our SwiftKey tool. And I said, well, why would I want to do that? And they said, well, have you ever had any trouble trying to send a text or type in a text in your language and it keeps switching to English? <laughs> I go, yeah, all the time. So, well, let us help you. So, okay, so I gave them um, some resources, helped them along the way, and they ended up creating a Māori language version of SwiftKey um, that was freely available. <coughs> it's kind of really hard to see, but this is it working here. So this was a copy of a screen done by took yesterday. Um, over the left is my auntie texting me in Tereo Māori, and over the right is my answers. Um, my text is all clean and beautiful, and auntie's text is all over the place. <laughs> Actually, I've got to tell her about SwiftKey. Um, <laughs> it's a really cool tool because it allows you to text without switching your language, but it does better than that. Um, it auto-corrects Māori um, language words, but it does even better than that, it auto-predicts. So when I started typing, so you can't see the keyboard here, but before I started typing, it asked me if I wanted to write kia ora there. So it auto-predicts what you're going to say. So it makes typing in an indigenous language really fast. And it'll also learn and watch what you're doing, um, and if you type in a particular dialect, it will start auto-predicting in your dialect. So a simple tool, uh, works really well, I need to tell more people about it. Um, so we got a guy in uh, six months ago, tell some people on Facebook, I haven't really promoted it, that's bad from my part. This is a cool tool, it's free, it helps our language. We've got to let people know about it. Okay, a bunch of random thoughts as, as I run out of time. Uh, random thought number one. Uh, with technology comes lots of opportunities, a whole new realm of opportunities. Opportunities to do conversations, connections, uh, to meet people face to face. So we have an important tikanga, important cultural aspect that face to face is really important. We can kind of do that with technology. Uh, technology can make our language visible and exciting. It can assist in learning our language in ways that we haven't been able to do before. Um, and it can involve engagement over distance. <coughs> Uh, as a researcher, as an academic, there's a million of areas of research opportunities that are coming about because of social media, because of technology and languages. Uh, here's a couple of examples from Facebook. So this is a bunch of pages, Māori language activists, hardcore Māori language activists working on Facebook. Here's one page, here's another page, here's another page, here's another page, and one of my favourites, Mahuru Māori, which is like Māori Language Month, something that's finishing in Hawaii. Well, we have something similar in Aotearoa, it's in September. Māori word for September is Mahuri, Mahuri Māori. So, there are some Facebook pages that help uh, to converse, to speak, to encourage, to support languages, and they're awesome. Uh, this is Twitter. This is a count of people using Twitter per month. Um, so this is from 2000, it's hard to see, 2014 to 2018. And it's kind of hard to see, but the average is going up. Um, it spikes. We, we, when we first started monitoring Māori language use on Twitter, we noticed that there were these spikes. And so we, we did some digging around to figure out what was happening. 
one of the spikes was Māori Language Week. Everybody wants to treat a Māori Māori Language Week. So for all those guys who do a Language Week, you know, it gets used. Uh, the other spike was the Māori Language Kapahaka Festival, Te Matatungi. Once uh, people start performing at this festival, everybody wants to get on and treat and say how good they were or how good the other guy was. So Twitter is happening for Te Reo Māori and it's getting more and more important in young users' lives. <coughs> uh, these are apps. There's over 50 apps right now that you can download to help you learn Te Reo Māori. Um, 50 apps and there's another 20 or so websites that that don't actually specifically talk about teaching real Māori, but technology in real Māori. <clears throat> so there's a whole new realm of opportunities that are opening for our languages, um, but we've noticed something that's kind of happening. Um, so it used to be traditional knowledge was passed down intergenerationally you know, from parents to children. We've noticed that the younger people these days aren't going to their parents or their grandparents so much for knowledge. Uh, a lot of them are going to Facebook or uh, to online social media. So we, we've termed the phrase intra. It's not so much intergenerational, it's intragenerational. But they're not going up and down, they're not vertically, that's more horizontal. Um, that has some concerns for us that we need to look at, uh, but that's what's happening. Uh, Okay, data is really important. Okay, perhaps data is more important. Um, the more important, it's more important as time goes on. So the data is the new frontier. Uh, the more language data we create, and this um, this conference is about documenting languages. So it's about creating data on language. The more language data we create, the more knowledge we create. Uh, and with knowledge comes responsibility. So we have responsibilities to ensure that the language documentation, the language data we create is held responsibly. Uh, we need to think about who owns it, uh, the sovereignty of it, how it's manipulated for certain goals, um, and where it's stored. Uh, so one of the questions we're starting to ask, some of the initiatives we're doing now is, how do we collect the right data that suits our needs as languages? Okay, so data is becoming more and more important. It's kind of like the new commodity. Um, we are aware of that, um, and we need to think about that in the future. Uh, okay, hope for the future. Um, just, okay, so I haven't got much time left. Um, so there's a picture here of three devices. These are all my personal devices. Uh, this is my cell phone, this is the car I drive, and this is really the important device in our house, the remote for the TV. All of these devices have one thing in common. <clears throat> the thing they have in common is, I'm not, I'm not in class now, sorry. The, the thing they have in common is, actually let me show you. So here's my phone, okay. Uh, what's this? <coughs> what is the weather like tomorrow? In Honolulu tomorrow, it'll be cloudy with a high of 24 and a low of 18. How do I get to the airport? The best way to get to Daniel K. Inuya International Airport, HNL, by car is via IH1W and will take about 15 minutes in light traffic. Tell me a joke. <laughs> this might make you laugh. What do maths teachers like to eat with their coffee? A slice of pie. It always has dumb jokes. <coughs> uh, so what happened? I interacted with my phone using my voice. Um, and when you think about what the phone had to do, so first of all, it had to record my voice, then it had to convert it from speech to text, and then it had to process it. And some of those questions were like, well, where are you? Where do you want to go? You know, what are the current? So it had to do some processing. And then finally, it came up with an answer. And then it had to create my answer or its answer from text back into speech. 
three quite amazing things happening. Um, I can talk to my car, I sit down in my car, and my phone's in my pocket, it rings, I can answer it just by talking to my car. I can ask my car where to go, and it will tell me where to go now. I can ask, I can ask my car directions, and it will give me directions, and um, the remotes we can get these days, the top left button is a, or the top middle button is a microphone, you can click on the microphone, you can say, show me where the latest movie is on Netflix, for example, and it will go away and find it. <clears throat> so it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but it seems to me that a lot of the future for technologies is through voice. Um, when we interact with each other, um, we mostly interact with voice. So it seems to me that the future is heading in this direction. So my question for ourselves and for our language is how do we normalise our language in these technologies? How do we get it so that I can ask my phone in Te Reo Māori what are the directions to the airport? And it can read the Te Reo Māori text, can process it from a Māori language perspective or from a Māori perspective, and then it can present an answer in beautiful Māori language text that is, that is great. That's, I think, where we need to start heading. Um, I kind of hope the jokes will be better too in Te Reo Māori than <laughs> the jokes in English. So, this is, um, this is like the long-term, never-ending goal, but some of the goals that we've achieved over the last few years, I think, have been long-term, never-ending. So I think this is possible. Um, and if you go to that talk on Sunday morning, you, you'll even believe more that it's possible. <clears throat> A couple of quick more slides, and then that's me. Uh, so, what we're doing is we're working technology with endangered languages and it's kind of a challenge. Here's how I feel we could approach that challenge. Uh, we need to understand all the issues that are relevant, all the issues that are happening to us or, or to you, and it will be different for different languages um, and it will be different for different people who are working within the language and it will be different for who you want to work with. So I think it's really important that you look at the language, look at the environment, look at what you're trying to do, try and understand the issues. Um, we've got to predict and plan for the future, but the future is changing, and the future is changing rapidly, so predict and plan for change, for a changing future. Uh, Utilise and engage people in previous work. So. It's hard for one person to do everything by themselves. Much better to find someone who's done something similar and build on top of them. Go and find that language activist or the hardcore language activist and stick with them and build with them and work with them. Uh, you'll get things done much more quicker. Uh, Recognise opportunities when they present themselves to you and quite often they're meant to present, present themselves to you. So recognise that, run with that, and then take those opportunities uh, and it's harder to, what do we say it in English? Take those opportunities and then just go with it. Seize them, create, develop, build, be awesome. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Kupu Whakamutu now, final thoughts. So um, I, I want to close by mentioning a there's this guy in uh, Christchurch, he's a, he's a Pākehā guy, his name is Tim Bell, real famous computer scientist, does some good work with a program called Computer Science Unplugged. Um, he got a, a, a worldwide award a couple of years ago for the work that he's been doing. He's actually done a, a bit of work with our language as well. Really cool guy. He went over to New York, he received this award, and when he was at the presentation ceremony, he got up and he spoke, and he quoted this Māori saying, and I thought it was quite a, kind of weird how he appreciated what it meant, given that he's in computer science, and you know, he's not from an a indigenous background, he doesn't work with indigenous languages, um, but he, he mentioned the saying, and this is the saying, and he didn't say it correctly, but it didn't matter because he actually said it and he understood what the saying meant. Uh, so here's the saying, he te mea nui a te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. So what is the most important thing? Um, it is people, it is people, it is people. Um, we're here working with languages. 
Uh, languages allow us to talk from people to people. Languages allow us to share our thoughts, our aspirations, our knowledges between people. It's really all about the people. Um, so, <clears throat> what I want to say is, as you're doing your work, try and be that hardcore language activist, but just remember why we're doing this, and we're doing this for the people. Um, so, as this tangata standing up here, greeting all of you people out there and all of the work you're doing, te nā koutou, te nā koutou. Kia ora tātou katoa. Uh, thank you, Teitaka, for uh, a, f a fascinating and a wonderful talk. Um, we have some time for questions, so if you want to come up to these microphones, hopefully they'll turn on in the next uh, minute, and you can just uh, line up behind those and ask your questions. If, if you start talking, I might kick in. Hi, thank you so very much. I have two, many questions and I've chosen two and you choose which one to answer. One is uh, how do you work with teachers to actually use what you create? And that's a very much larger pro problem than that. We, that happens with everything that we do. Even if we work with the teachers or with a subset of the teachers, how do you get them to embrace and to move out of their comfort zone to use what you have done? And the second one is uh, sovereignty. How do uh, expand, if you can, on the issue of technology and sovereignty? Because those tools that, we, that you have created, you are not the owner of them, right? Uh, the archives, we are not the owners of them, right? The universities, the uh, societies, whatever, are the owners of it. So we are l l losing the power to control what they are used for, who controls them, and all that. And thank you so very much. Okay, uh, order for the questions. Um, so, um, how do I work with teachers? So this has a, been a, quite a big failing. The, the work that we did with Microsoft, we really should have got on board. In New Zealand, we have the Ministry of Education. We should, really should have got the Ministry of Education on board so that they could promote the issue to their teachers um, and provide training for their teachers. We didn't do that. We just went ahead and, and translated all of the stuff. I don't think we work really well with teachers. I think we need to sort that out. Um, and that's difficult because teachers are one of the most time um, precious or you know time overburdened people of all. So it's hard to get them to take time away to, to learn to use some of these tools. Um, the school where the, that Microsoft technology really worked was the school where my children went because I had the time to sit with those teachers and explain how it was working. Uh, ideally, I should have like recorded that and made that available to all of the schools, but I didn't. So that's a really great point, it's something that we need to consider. <clears throat> In terms of sovereignty, so this is a really important issue that we're struggling with at the moment. So in the Google example, they've got Google translating, they've got Google translate, translating for Māori language, we have no control how well that works or how well it doesn't work. Uh, when I noticed it was giving errors, I contacted them a couple of times, but they're really hard to respond. And it's, when you're not inside Google, it's really hard to get in there. So that is an issue. We also, the work we did with Microsoft, so we created um, uh, 400,000 strings of translations, but Microsoft kept those. You know, this is some, some valuable translation, you know, um, documentation that we went through, they wouldn't give those to us because, because of the strings, they, they had copyright on the strings and you know they paid for the translation so it was kind of like their right I guess. I, I hope nobody from Microsoft is in the room. <laughs> um, th they've been really good to our language um, but I made sure I like kept a copy of those translations so uh, we're not being recorded are we or anything? 
Um, so, so like I've I've got a copy and you know I've trying to been able to share on the slide, but it's certainly an important point. Um, I, for those two examples, we've kind of the boat sailed. Um, but what we what we want to do from now on is any initiatives that we do, initiatives that involve Maori language data or even just Maori data, try and ensure that we have the rights. Don't cede our rights. Control our own rights. Look after our own data. Protect it ourselves. Don't give it to large international corporations because they really, they say they do, but ultimately they really don't care about the language the way we care about it. Great questions. Thanks. Hello, if I may. Uh, I, don't really, I don't really have a question, but an observation, a story, which, which combines very well with what you taught, exactly about the same question of, if you built it, will they, will, will they come? I live now in Iceland, and Icelandic as an endangered language is an odd thing because it's a major national language with schools and media and everything, but it is a fight for the domains. And the digital domain, like Microsoft, Google, and so forth, is a domain where even major languages are in competition with English. So in the Icelandic system, they translated Microsoft, Google, everything into Icelandic, Facebook. There's, it's all in Icelandic. But if you ask the people, what do they use? Most of them answer, they use it in English anyway. And I guess you get even similar results if you ask people, at least with an academic background or who work internationally in Germany or in any other country. I guess English is, in the digital domain, the strongest language, even if all the other options are available and people are native speakers and otherwise use their language in all other domains. Uh, thank you. Um, it's harder for our people to use our language sometimes. And that's just a fact, it's harder to use our language. Sometimes it's easier to use English, um, but we just have to be strong and promote and be hardcore about it. Uh, that, that's a fact of life, it is harder to use our language. Um, there's a group of, there's a whole bunch of people in, in Aotearoa in New Zealand that will use a language no matter what. No matter what the situation is, they're just going to use a language, and it's kind of we're going to try and promote those kind of people. But it is harder. That's a fact of life. That's the doom and gloom. But there's hope. Let's thank our uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. So much. <laughs>